Misha Talavo! Welcome to the Lepanto Institute's General Quarters. Today we have with us a special guest, author, speaker, and scholar, Dr. Janice Smith. But first, if you like what you see here, then hit the subscribe and like button. And if you're able and you appreciate our defense of the truth and wish to support, support us, please go to lepantoin.org slash donate. We cannot, fight, we cannot fight for the Catholic faith and the truth without good folks like you supporting us, so we greatly appreciate it. So let's get to it. So... Dr. Smith uh, speaks nationally and internationally on, ca on Catholic teachings regarding sexuality and bioethics. She has taught at such institutions as Notre Dame, University of Dallas, Sacred Heart Seminary, Ave Maria College in Michigan. She's the author of Humanae Vitae, A Generation Later, and A Right to Privacy. Uh, a third uh, volume that she has published uh, is, we've well, already published essays on Humanae Vitae and the thoughts of John Paul II. Professor Smith served three terms as a consultor to the Pontifical Council on the Family and also served as a member of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission No. 3 for eight years. She has a regular column in the National Catholic Register. She's received three honorary doctorates and has appeared on such news programs as The Geraldo Show, Fox Morning News, CNN International, CNN Newsroom, Al Jazeera, as well as EWTN. Uh, also, more than 2 million copies are being circulated, have been circulated of Contraception, Why Not? And actually, that's the first time uh, I became acquainted with the works of, of Dr. Smith. Her materials can be found at janetsmith.org. Free copies are available there. Uh, and I can also say, having spent some time around her recently, uh, Dr. Smith has a almost ninja-like <laughs> legal sense of humor. <laughs> Dr. Smith, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Good to be here. Thank you very much. Um, today we are discussing what I consider uh, an extremely uh, troubling issue within the Catholic Church. Specifically, good traditional priests attempting to perform their duties and defend church teaching are being punished or canceled, if you will. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith, you, you spent many years in a seminary and you have a unique vantage point from which to comment. And from what I've seen uh, and read, the current clerical culture starts clearly at the formative seminary level. Now, I know you have a great affection and respect for your time at Sacred Heart Seminary. And my, my question is pointing more towards a, a macro view of the formation of seminarians. So, so can we begin there? What are your, Dr. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate that um, disclaimer because I, I really did have a very, very good experience at Sacred Heart. Uh, and it's not... Uh, that institution that has any more particular problems than any other. Uh, there's a, uh, a culture in seminaries that seems to me, even though there's been a, a, a considerable improvement in uh, seminaries since the investigations in 2005, um, there still remain cultural problems that are very, uh, uh, they, they're, they're very much the cause of the problems that we have in, in the church today. And it is an idea of the priesthood as, in a sense, an excessively uh, docile uh, profession that is meant to just completely be under the sway of the bishop and not allowed to express any views of um, dif difficulties that go on. The, the priest may be consulted about this project or that project, all right? But they're told from pretty much the minute they get in the seminary, they're supposed to keep their head down. They're supposed to stay in their own lane and they're um, not to rock the boat. And so they, they get formed in a culture that is very, um, very, it creates docility in these men rather than boldness. I mean, we're, we're all startled. We've now had in the last two years, this incredible influx of fantastic homilies from bold uh, priests. Oh, great but point. I, I promise you very few of them have ever heard a bold homily themselves. And they probably gave their bold homily for the first time in the last two years because they've been provoked. They've been so, so tremendously provoked by the denial of the sacraments that they, they have just decided, I, I, I can't take it anymore. And I'm going to speak from my heart. and I'm going to say what needs to be said. Uh, when I taught at the seminary, one of the assignments I had often in my classes is that the young men had to give a homily on a, a moral topic. 
not just sort of racism, but something that was really, really, truly controversial, like homosexuality or same um, contraception, uh, pornography. And, sure. Uh, that was amazing what happened. All right. First of all, it was it was startling. Everybody, when they started speaking and giving this homily, were all sort of feeling like, whoa, are you allowed to do this? Are you are you allowed to say up there that there's sins and there's serious sins and you need to stop the serious sin? And I'm I'm doing this even though that I know some of you are gonna be mad and walk out on this. Um, I'm gonna do it anyway. And most of them started very sensibly by saying, you know, this is my responsibility. I'm, I'm not doing my job unless I say these things. And then these young men, who otherwise did seem to me to be excessively timid, all of a sudden became really fa like paternal. They were fathers. They were taking ownership of their people. It's like, and I told them this, I said, you know, I have a brother who has six kids. I said, when his feet hit the floor in the morning, he's basically thinking about how can I teach these kids what they need to know to get to heaven, all right? Mm -hmm. To be good people, you know, keep their jobs, marry the right woman or man and get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And I said, when your feet hit the floor in the morning, your, your um, view has to be, how can I get my congregation to heaven? What are they doing that they shouldn't be doing that would be an obstacle? And I said, you know, there's so many of them out there using pornography. So many out there are even cohabiting. And I said, it, they're, they're sitting there thinking, you know, that guy gave up his whole life for me. He laid down his life for me. And if he thought there was something that was an obstacle for me getting to heaven, he would tell me. So he right. hasn't said anything about pornography. He hasn't said anything about cohabitation. So they just can't be that bad because he never says anything about that. What a great point. I, I, I mean, I'm sitting here listening to you. And. When you think about it, and I, from my own personal experience, I, I, I go to the uh, the traditional Latin math, mass and also the Norvis Odo, sometimes I have to. But wow, what, what, a, what a difference in, in homilies. And, I, and what brought me over to the traditional Latin math was exactly where mass is exactly what you're talking about. Um, and especially if I could being from a, maybe you can comment on this because you have a real unique perspective because you taught all men. And, yes. and, and the thing is that these are this call to action, this, uh, this, this, this war, this ideation of war is what brings out the best in men. Y can you speak to that in the sense of, you know, these that's right. Uh, and I, I absolutely think that's right. I mean, I, I think there's certainly merit in um, uh, uh, Pope Francis's understanding as, a, as the church as a field hospital, all right? But it's on the field of what? It's on, the field. it's on the field of a war, all right? And and the wounds should really be because of the battle you're fighting for goodness, all right? And the battles that you will be battered if you fight for goodness. These priests who give these bold homilies are battered, uh, very possibly by their parishioners, though it's astonishing how many priests tell me that when they give these bold homilies, they just get besieged by people who say, I've never heard anything like this. Thank you so much. I've never heard anybody, a priest talk about mortal sin from the pulpit. And, and one that touches our community, one that's not over there that other people do. And we think they're so bad because they're that way. But what we do here and taking accountability for our own our own behavior. So it, it is a very manly thing to do. It's, it's fighting a battle. It's being a father. And it's fighting a battle, and it's a battle for which you will get a lot of incoming flack. People won't, a lot of people won't like it. And then other priests get mad at you because then their parishioners are saying, Father so and so is doing this, why aren't you doing that? And so again, it's rocking the boat, and they've been told not to rock the boat. So they're, they're those who, who do these things, um, we have to understand what a big motion it is on their part. It shouldn't be that hard. As you said, it's because it's a part of the male identity. And I could tell my seminarians felt great when they did this. You could just see their, their chest go up and their shoulders get straighter because they were doing a manly thing. Um, but they're told that they're n that's not a part of the ethos of the seminary. It's not part of what goes on in the seminary. You're meant to, oh, heaven forbid, the guy that goes to the top and says something about you know, I really think it was wrong for you to do this uh, that interrupted our finals week or for something you wanted all of us to go greet somebody who came to town and it was interrupting our, our study and really was it that important. Oh, my gosh, that is not welcomed. Um, you know, that 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 is I mean, it, there are complainers and you have to squash the complainers and get them to stop whining and complaining. <laughs> but it, but if it is a bold action, then they have to 
be able to recognize that. Which ones are actions of whining and complaint and which actions are bold uh, efforts to make the community better? Well, uh, well, and, yes, I don't I, see such distinctions being made. Yep, I, exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It just occurred to me, but I, I'd like to get on this path if I could for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it be any organizational structure, corporate, religious, uh, there is a definitive, there's an atmosphere, there's an environment. This is how we do things, right? And yet, how interesting was it? And the guy I'm thinking of is Father James Altman, right? Mm -hmm. I, never heard of, I never heard of this priest from, mm -hmm. from Wisconsin. And so we're all locked down during COVID. And you, know, and, and you and I both know that we, we know people in this circle and we pass videos around to each other, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm sitting on my couch, locked down, you know, just kind of wondering how odd this is. And all of a sudden, this guy gets on. Right. And I'm going, who is this guy? You know, and, and he just he just laid it out. And, and, and I, he reminds me of a real uh, you know, kind of a masculine guy and, 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 and uh, you know, no nonsense. This is the deal. And then he actually got more aggressive as time went on. And I, I which and people were cheering. And I was the guy's got a following. And, and I guess I, I want to ask you, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. There's a real feminization uh, that I, I, I see, uh, and I'll talk about my experience a little later in, in the seminary as, as to the, uh, the product that it produces. Clear message, uh, do not stand up and rock the boat, right? You know, whatever your job is to, you know, kind of keep things going along and keep the money coming or whatever, to the, um, that's conjecture. But if you could speak to a little bit to that, uh, that feminization of, uh, of the clergy, because as I said, it's not just... Yes, you were in a seminary, but but you're you're wired in, and and uh, you know you you know you you know a lot of uh, what goes on out there. And if you could maybe just talk about that feminization a little bit. Well, the feminization, it's it, it, I don't know, effeminization we might want to say because fem yeah. feminine women can be very bold. I mean, no I um, yes, for you, no is not, is not incompatible with being feminine. Um, as a matter of fact, I used to get a string of priests that would come by my office at the <laughs> seminar and stick their head in and say, thank you for being so bold at the faculty meeting today. You can say things we can't say, right? Now, how sad is that? All right, you can say things we can't say. And what does that mean they can't say them? Uh, it, it, it means that, again, there'll be a little black mark by their name and when there's a consideration, and it's not necessarily a promotion, but an assignment that they're well-suited for, that they really want, they won't get it. All right, because they have stepped on some toes by by being bold, and um, so it's 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 a matter of uh, I don't want to attach it so much to feminiz feminization, but I want to attach it to as I said before, excessive docility. That instead of and, and and what the problem is that the they get they they are oppressed in a certain sense and suppressed for in a certain sense while they're in seminary. And that sometimes is, is a cause of the clericalism and the kind of domineering ways when they leave. It's like I have to spend six years getting stepped on. I'm gonna, I get to be in charge now, all right? And that's what they, wow. and that's what they've had modeled for them. This is what you do when you're below you, you're subservient. When you're above, you're domineering. They don't have any other models um, of, of or they may have some models, but again, usually the good ones are on the sidelines. They're not brought, they're not brought forward as a really good example of what to be. Instead, the ones that are cons get, get promoted, the ones that are on the inner circle, are those who are true, true yes men. They tell the bishop what he wants to hear. But, right. And by the way, I'm glad you corrected me on that because as the words feminization came out of my mind, it came out of my mouth rather, I was like, oh, that, that's really not the word I was looking for. So I, I do right. appreciate you correcting me on that. And uh, so that I really was appreciative of the, I'm not just saying that for appeasement. Um, so thank you for that. You know, if I could, and, and then we'll transition over to actually current day priests, but I was discussing with you before the show a little bit. I had sort of my own experience with this and I went to, Two, uh, in my 20s, I went to two seminaries to discuss a, a possible vocation. I was really surprised that uh, they did not come back. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, this is very odd. I was a Wall Street guy, graduated from Purdue. I'm just kind of going, hey, wow. And, and, you know, the one hand was like, well, God, I guess you don't want me to do this. Uh, frankly, part of me was like maybe a little relief. Now, I'm not sure if I had a vocation, to, 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 to be honest. Let me be clear about that. Uh, you know, who knows, but I just found it very odd. They didn't even, uh, they didn't even pursue it. And I talked about, uh, I actually talked about 
common, or rather subjects of strength. Uh, the rosary, uh, personal discipline, uh, what I thought the priesthood required, you know, and I was wondering why one guy in particular smirked, like he was smirking. <laughs> no, when I first got to the seminary, I mean, the seminarians were assessed by a female um, psychologist who was troubled if they didn't uh, approve of women priests. And so even before they get in, they're in this um, quandary. I know what she wants to hear. Do I tell it to her? Or do I wow. act like an act I that. that I know will be a black mark against me for being admitted? Now, I think that has been stopped, but that was very common. And again, as you said, if they, there were, if any, oh my God, if anybody wanted to wear a cassock, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's, you know, and as you said, the, 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 the rosary is, you know, you kind of look the other way. But that I mean, was bad I, enough, the rosary, but a cassock? <laughs> and one of my, one of the four meters when I was there told me once he would see the young men, you know, go in the hallway past the door of the chapel and make the sign of the cross. He said, what kind of superstition is that? You know, I said, it's not a superstition, it's a sign of respect. But it was, it was this, that was, that was a mark against them. If he saw them walking in front of the chapel, of course, the blessed sacraments in there. When you walk in front of the blessed sacrament, even though a door is closed, you want to make a sign of the cross just to acknowledge the presence of Jesus that's that distance away from you. But for, for this priest, it was considered to be, you know, again, kind of superstitious. Um, I don't know what kind of superstition he's talking about, but I mean, the horror stories are many, 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 many. Um, these are uh, uh, these are fairly innocent compared to the the homosexual predation that went on in seminaries for decades and decades. And um, there was, you know, uh, Donald Cousins in the early two thousands uh, that uh, published a book called "The Changing Face of the Priesthood," in which he said, "We have to acknowledge we have a homosexual priesthood." Uh, he said it's rapidly becoming more and more homosexual. Now, he wasn't necessarily opposed to that, but what he wanted was that we recognize that and adjust accordingly. Now, what that adjusting accordingly means, I'm not exactly sure, but in the 70s and 80s and some well into the 90s in many places, the heterosexual men were driven out and the homosexual men were uh, promoted. And one, one price of promotion often was having sex with a, a priest or a bishop. Good Lord. And it's, it, 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 I mean, it, yes, you're, you're shaking your head in, in disbelief and pain. And that's exactly right. That's oh, exactly okay. right. Uh, I, I, I sent you the article, which was my commentation, comment, commenting on a study done by Professor Cavadini at the Notre okay. Dame, the McGrath Institute, a couple of years ago, right after the McCarrick um, crisis. And, you know, as all of us good Catholics trying to get to the bottom of this and saying, you know, the bishops will want to be informed about how bad things are so that they can fix them. And so we're just going to dig around and see what we can find. And he did this wonderful survey, anonymous survey, very professionally done, um, sent it out to the seminaries to ask about how many of the men there had experienced um, being hit upon or pressured or assaulted um, e even, and how, how, you know, how sincere the teaching was on celibacy, etc. Well, 48, I think, percent of, of seminaries did not respond, right? right? Did not respond. Now, that in itself is incredibly telling. These were anonymous surveys, anonymous. So what danger is there in, in responding except they don't trust the process and they don't, they don't want to say what's going on because people would want to know. I think there were some 2% of seminarians reported uh, really very serious sexual assault and up to 10% had had something happen that was a very dubious in their minds about proper sexual uh, treatment. And, and mostly it was the seminarians who gave honest reports um, and the seminary didn't say much. And I would say, why hasn't each and every seminary uh, done a very thorough independent review uh, of, you know, all say last 30, 40 years, everybody that they can find who has been there, who has taught there, see who has graduated. I mean, I think some of these seminaries would have an incredibly bad graduation rate for uh, priests who have been accused of, credibly accused of sexual abuse. If they said, how many of our graduates, I mean, look at Pennsylvania, for instance, if all those hundreds of, of um, boys who have been abused, there's if there's hundreds, there's hundreds more. Uh, hundreds who have come forward, there's hundreds more who haven't. And um, to try to track them down. 
and just say, "Can you, will you talk to us? What happened? Who was it? Uh, no, they're not doing that. I mean, right. again, a few journalists are trying to do keep up with things as best they can, but every seminary, every seminary board, anybody who's on a seminary board who hasn't asked for this is not doing their fiduciary responsibility in respect to seminaries. They have to say, we don't want an internal investigation. Nope, 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 nope. Because we, we understand that you guys are, it's like recusing yourself at a trial. You're under too much pressure. Pressure. You can't, you know, we, we, we don't want to put you under that pressure to try to tell the truth in, in this atmosphere. So we're going to get outside people and we're going to demand honesty. We're going to, you know, and we're going to, anyway, so you can't see the bishops won't do it. The bishops won't do it because they know what they'll find. The lay people have the lay people who are funding and have a fiduciary responsibility at the seminaries absolutely have to do this. It's one of the ways we can go. So anybody listening to this should go look and see who's on the board of the seminary where their um, uh, young men are being trained to be priests. And they should write letters to the board um, and send them this uh, this video and a couple other documents that I'm, I know Jim will post that will be very helpful them to have on what should be going on at a seminary and why, 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 why they need to do uh, an investigation. Great point, uh, Doctor. You know, and uh, as a matter of fact, I, you sent me two articles, and I thought this uh, the second one was, was tremendous. I, I'll put those both in the show notes with your permission. Uh, you know, well, I, because I, I think that call to action, what you just said, that's a real tangible thing to do. And and, and you know, if nothing else, because you know, uh, for lack of a better term, the lavender mafia is uh, pretty entrenched. And uh, and and this is the more people we get uh, showing up and saying, "Hey, you know, we're watching this." And uh, who's kidding who? There's, there's stuff going on. And, and especially with the arm, if, if, if we, if these seminaries did what you just had suggested and, and called back, you know, did a call back in the last 15, 20 years ago, hey, why'd you leave? Or what happened there? And then really speaking honestly under a guaranteed anonymity, that would be, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not doing that. Um, and th that's just awful. If, if, um, if we could maybe, uh, if we could move on, maybe fast forward to the second part of this and uh, this is something that, you know you and I have talked about in the past, but what I find really disconcerting is the good priests out there uh, who have been, uh, for lack of a better word, tortured. And, mm -hmm. and, and these are guys who have stood up and um, have not rolled over and have really, um, really sort of, been, you know, uh, planted a flag and, and, and tried to defend the faith as well as call, you know, uh, call publicly out on things that, uh, that were wrong. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't help but think of, um, you know, I, I recently I met Father Kalchak uh, in Chicago and, you know, very, very, very uh, I, I found him to be just a really solid man. And, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, Father, I, uh, I, I, we're just meeting for the first time, but I know your entire story. I followed it closely. I can't believe what happened. And so for, for those of us, for those who are listening, who don't know the story, would you mind maybe going into a little bit about you Father do. Kalchak and... Yes, uh, I meant to do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I thought you were going to do it. Do you want me to do it? If you don't mind. Yeah. I just kind of you thought. You're going to have to correct me. But I mean, he had sure. he, he had inherited a passage that was uh, run by a pastor who was very LGBTQ friendly uh, yes. to the point of putting up a banner uh, in front of the crucifix that was a rainbow banner. Um, and I believe even Bernadine said a mass there happily with that banner. Um but behind him, well, the You're banner comes, that was it, there, and, and there's a picture of that with Bernadine saying mass. Yeah, there's, there's a picture of that online, <laughs> and it, it's a, I always think, I always think this is Photoshop. Is right. it? It's Photoshop. So anyway, at some point, that banner got stuck in a closet, and after uh, Father Kolchek was there for a while, uh, someone discovered that that banner and wanted to um, burn it. Uh, and I believe the 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 parishioners did it. I, I Father Kolchik may have looked on, but he was um, removed very brutally uh, from the priesthood for from active priesthood yes. uh, because he he allowed it to happen. Uh, you know, these two representatives, priestly representatives, a bishop, I think one of them was an auxiliary bishop, showed up and you know basically wanted to drag him off. He escaped <laughs> through the back door. Um, and it's just shocking. It's just shocking. Yeah. You know, say, well, what does it mean to to burn that banner? It's not just some isolated banner that was somewhere. You know, it's not like something something a kid hung in his bedroom. It was hung in front of the crucifix and was used as you know a a, 
a focal point for the mass, for the mass, for the mass. And uh, you want to say it, it, it was it's a desecration of the of the church and things that are desecrate the church are meant to be burnt, are meant to be destroyed. And, it, and he should have been he should have been complimented for that. He should have been lauded for that. And instead, exactly. he is, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they we have wanted him to go for psychological counseling somewhere because he obviously has deep homophobic um, problems, you know. And obviously, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Anyway, so <laughs> so this culture. I too have met him, and I have to say, he's one of these guys that's almost scary smart. Oh you know, yeah. Right. He just knows so much. You talk to him and he just, there's all these things come into the conversation. You're like, whoa, I didn't know that. I'm so glad to know that. I didn't know that. I, zoom, zoom, zoom. You know, and you just, he's a gentle, beautiful man. And to think what a, what a great pastor he must have been and should be. And there he is languishing um, because the diocese can't admit that it was wrong. Wow. And, you know, it just, I would add one thing to it, which I think is kind of central in understanding that one story. First of all, that goes on a lot. Secondly, I call it the two the two uh, priests showed up from the Cardinal's office, Supic, uh, to send him to re-education camp. That's what I call it. Yeah. And, and it was interesting because the uh, the it was known as the the homosexual parish in Chicago, where as you pointed out, which I also thought was photoshopped, there was a picture of Bernadine <laughs> celebrating mass with that in the background. Um, but the, I found it interesting that the, the parishioners were hungry for a solid priest. And when he showed up, you know, the parishioners were the ones who did this because the last guy died under really uh, suspect conditions, uh, you know, it, uh, you know in, in, his, in, in the rectory, quite literally surrounded by a mountain of porn, gay porn and other things. That was going, that's what was going on. The parishioners had had it. Um, this new guy shows up. They found out he was a solid guy. And they're like, look, we want to burn this thing. I don't even think he lit the match with pardon. He said, yeah, sure. Makes sense. Said some prayers. You know, what? why wouldn't you want to burn a symbol like that? Um, and, and, you know, to move on, um, the other priest is, uh, is, which I've never met. I've never met him. I've met Father Kalchek. But Father Perone in Detroit, look what they did to him. And there's hundreds of these stories. You know, um, you, you know him personally, right? And I, I like, I know a lot of people who know him personally. I, and if you could comment on that, I hear he's a very solid, absolutely solid man, a priest's priest, wonderful, has a track record of something like 40 years. I mean, you can't hide stuff over 40 years. They, they, they bring out this phony accusation against them. And it was so bad that even I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the accuser backed off and said, no, this is not right. The police got involved to, to, to hang this guy. Can you talk about him a little bit? Yeah. Well, um, there's a Monsignor Bougarin, who's the canon lawyer for right. the Diocese of Detroit, and he hired this lady detective who's a part of his parish to uh, examine this, this very troubled man. Obviously, something really bad happened to him. Um, and for some reason, and there's a, you know some suggestion that somebody put the idea in his mind, that, that what happened to him was sexual abuse 40 years ago in the parish of Father Perone, and it was Father Perone who did it. Right. He right, didn't. Right. It doesn't seem like he volunteered that he came in knowing this, what it is. I mean, coming in and I'm telling you this, Father Perone, no, something horrible happened to me. Well, let's review your past. Well, where were you an altar boy? I was an altar boy here. Oh, well, that's where it probably happened. And it was probably <laughs> Father Perone, you know, who, who I say has had a target on his back for the last 40 some years because he wrote some devastating um reports on the presence of homosexuality in Sacred Heart Seminary um, years ago. Uh, they were, in fact, a very big part of Michael Rose's book on Goodbye Good Men. So oh, he's, great had, book. Yeah. he's had a target on his back for all that time. So it was just sort of, you hate to say it, but you think somebody's eyes are brightening up. We have somebody who is an altar boy under Father Perone, and he's- obviously And he's malleable. <laughs> yeah, he's very, and so, so this lady detective, um, Last name was Paige, I believe. She uh, she completely falsified his testimony, and he he later, you know, uh, said, I, "I never said that. I never said that. I never said that." So, Perone took her to uh, to some sort of negotiation and uh, settled mediation or something, and he won. He won one hundred twenty five thousand dollars, which unfortunately the police department paid, not her, even though she wasn't acting in an official capacity. She was acting as a friend. Um, to Monsignor Bougarin. So like, what is the status of our law enforcement, read the church? 
if they're willing to pay for misconduct of a, of a lady detective who even wasn't on the job when she uh, was getting this information. So Father Perone has been, uh, uh, it seems to me, vindicated by the court system. And then his the diocese had a canon law procedure against him. And that was dropped, which apparently is very, very rare that it wasn't even considered. It's not like it came forward and they, they said, no, the evidence is not there. We cannot even take this case, which apparently by the time they, I mean, the Vatican has excessive respect for archbishops and cardinals. And when they make a complaint, it's, oh yes, let's take a look at it. And when they said, we're not even gonna take a look at this, that's a huge slap on the hand of the, of the diocese. And of course they did the right thing. If it was based on verifiably false accusations, you don't let it go forward. Um, but, and now they're they're having a case against Perone, again, because they, 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 they're not happy. They're not happy that he's still, that. They haven't reinstated him, and they're going to um, have some canonical action against him, evidently for some sort of disobedience of the terms that were put upon him when the accusation was was made. Um, wow! Was told, and and I mean, the, the one big question is going to be: Were those prohibitions in any way just or not? Um, one of them was that he, you know, was told to be quiet, which basically says, "Don't defend yourself." You can't defend yourself. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and, and so it, 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 you know, it, it, everybody has a right to a reputation. Um, uh, and a priest doesn't give up his right to his reputation when he becomes a priest. And the obedience owed to a bishop doesn't include allowing yourself to be crucified by the whole diocesan process. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, you know, uh, Dr. Smith, if there's, that there's one 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 more thing I want to ask you because I, I heard you talk about this and I and I find it adds to your uh, your credibility tremendously because I believe you when you say this. Um, you had to be kind of pulled in this direction. Would you say that's fair? In, in other words, let me let me rephrase that. Um, you for many years, like myself and a lot of other people. We see, wow, you know, you'd see things going on with bishops or the church. You go, well, they must know what they're doing, and you know, okay, you know, they, they have to have a plan here. And I don't understand it. It looks cagey to me, but uh, I'm just going to continue along this way until it, till you know, with a little more time and education, and of course, my character. And it was like, forget it. <laughs> is that is that fair? Like, uh, could you talk to you about your yeah, experience that way a little bit? Right. I mean, I, I, I'm actually saying I've been, I've been. Um, <clears throat> almost certainly culpably and maybe criminally naive a lot of my life in respect to the church. I, I think it happened at my confirmation and I got this incredible wallop of these graces to fight the battle for the church. And so um, a lot of my life has been fighting the battle for the church. And I, I had such affection for the church, I, I couldn't even see the possibility that the bishops were corrupt. Uh, I just assumed that um, when they did things that I couldn't understand, like not funding uh, pro-life offices, like not uh, really speaking out against abortion, like not funding family life offices, not promoting natural family planning, you know, largely funding left-wing politics and all of their public statements and uh, supporting them. I just, oh, they must have some, they must have a good, a good uh, reason for this. And, um, and, and then finally, when McCar and, and then I read a lot about the sex abuse crisis over the years, and I thought it was a few isolated men, and that surely if I knew about it, the bishops were taking care of it. And when I read Michael Rose's book, I thought surely there are bishops all over the United States who are, um, who are uh, doing something about this. And then the McCarrick situation came out, and I said, I, I can't just can't take it. Um, they clearly knew about this. They've been doing it. I've got to take a look into this. I'm no longer giving them the benefit of the doubt. I am going to start listening to all the evidence that there is against the bishops. And I found it overwhelming. I started, I had this naive view. Again, it's naivety goes deep in my, my system. I thought, oh, well, we'll just find out the best bishops and we'll go talk to them and we'll, we'll convince them that the lady really wants them to clean up the church and they'll do it. And I made a list of 40 bishops that I thought were good bishops. Then I sat down and after about an hour, it got reduced to 20. And then I talked to someone who is very highly placed, who knows all about bishops and unbelievably knows what he knows. And we go down and we can't, it's under five. It's under five. 
that we think are um, really trustworthy. And the, even these, I mean, even the best of bishops are what I want to call complicit. They have inherited very bad situations in their diocese. When they come in, they've got a stack of folders of priests um, who have done bad, with reports of priests have done bad things about which nothing has been done. They have information about their predecessors, um, which about which no one has done anything. And I have actually heard from bishops um, almost from their own mouth, secondhand, that they don't even read these, these files because they don't want to know, because they don't know what they would do. What would you do if you would find out that one third of your presbyterate have been accused of sexual misconduct? What would you do? All right. I hope you would call them in and all say, you know, if if uh, if you aren't ready to reform your life, if you want to keep on doing what you're doing, uh, goodbye. I'll give you a yeah. nice little package out of the priesthood. And if if it's not with minors, um, but it's still sexual, that if it's minors, we're, we're turning you over to the law. If right, it's other right. kinds of sexual misconduct, women or men, all right, um, we're going to say, uh, you know, you want to re recommit yourself to a chaste priesthood, come talk to me and I will um, try to help you. Uh, and if I, your name is in here and you haven't come forward, I'm coming after you and we're cleaning up this priesthood. And if it means we lose a third of our presbyterate, then we do. Um, but we will have a, a, a reliable, faithful, uh, trustworthy um, presbyterate. And that's what we want. But no, no bishop, that I, I believe Strickland has done something like that. I don't know if any other bishop, possibly Olmsted, has done something like that. But uh, across the board, and even if they did do it, they won't say it. I mean, if they did do it, I wish they would tell us because they would. we would trust them. But I think they won't tell us because uh, other bishops will think they're being critical of them. Again, so you might do the right thing in your own diocese, but you won't uh, publicize it because you're rocking the boat. And they've been told not to rock the boat. Great analysis. I. <laughs> Sadly, that's uh, that's probably right. I, I, I and I, I look. I'm never going to be a bishop, but I'm certain that's how I'd handle it. I, I, I mean it. I, that's exactly how I'd handle it. And uh, anyone, you know, particularly with offenses that were uh, minor children. I mean, that's not even a question. Then we call the cops on them immediately. Right? And here's here's what I know. And then and then the other ones, um, you know, clean up your act, or uh, you know, uh, you know, but the harm you're doing to the people is, is immeasurable. And, uh, and you know what you're doing. And I, I just, I find it interesting. One kind of last point is I find terrible. I, I remember that uh, Chicago had a couple of uh, priests from the South American corridor who were, uh, who were uh, busted in Miami for two, two priests actually, for engaging in a sexual act in broad daylight. Um, and yet those guys were, you know, they were handled and just kind of shuffled off somewhere. And yet guys like uh, Father Perone or Father Kalchek uh, were, 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 were tortured. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? It's really sort of, it's just, there's just no uh, sense of justice here in any way, shape or form. But um, I think uh, I think we're about gonna come to a close, Dr. Smith, but I, I have to thank you. I, I really I really thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you on this subject and, uh, and meeting you uh, like we did uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and it, hopefully uh, you'll, you'll come back. So, you know, if we can, uh, if we can talk you into it. There's a, oh, you won't have to talk me into it. There's a lot to, to dissect here. And again, it's very, very hard for Catholics to believe this stuff. And so, right. and you know, they, we have to, honestly, we have to, uh, I mean, not everybody has to, I mean, if it's disturbing their faith, I say, stop, absolutely stop right. reading the news, stop thinking about it, stop listening to me or anybody else who's disturbing your faith. Just go, receive the sacrament, say your prayers. All right. But those of you who, um, you know, for a lot of people, I've actually known it's deepened their faith in a, in a strange way. It's like, I love this church. I, I realize had, more and more. One of them. Yeah. I, I actually, I actually, I, I, okay, I'm so glad you said that. And we, we never rehearsed this, but I actually, it's McCarrick, all these things actually deepen my faith because it seemed to me that there was such um, a, an orchestrated assault of evil towards the Catholic Church that you would, that they seem to have escaped other ones. I mean, there was a real, this was, to me, it seemed like diabolical. This was systemic, mm -hmm. incremental, and they moved and moved. And I remember, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, you know, 
anyone who would go to this trouble, what, why would you, you there, there has to be some reason behind going to this trouble, starting with Bella Dodd and with your, um, actually with your uh, knowledge, probably farther back than that. But, but there was a, uh, there was a purpose here to destroy, destroy Rome. And, um, and, and I just, I had to ask myself, wow, it's actually what got me in the fight. McCarrick and it was the, was the first shot. And what actually set me over the edge was the Pachamama mm -hmm. Rome. I just went, is anyone noticing this? You know, so, but we'll, 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 we'll definitely bring it back. Cause I, I suspect, uh, number one is I really enjoyed it. But, um, number two is, uh, we'll have unfortunately plenty to talk about Dr. Smith. <laughs> so. There you go. So closing, uh, I think we're going to we're going to leave it there. Uh, Liz, we, miss, we to thank Dr. Smith again for speaking with us today and, and offering her thoughts. Uh, lastly, uh, we request again, if you like what you see here, please hit the subscribe and like button. And if you appreciate our effort, efforts at the Lepanto Institute, please consider uh, donating at lepantoin.org slash donate. We can only uh, do this if good folks like you support us. Uh, and please know it's appreciated. That being said, until next time, this is Jim Maughan from the Lepanto Institute General Quarters saying goodbye. Thanks again and vivo Cristo Rey. Bye. Thank you again, Doctor. Thank you, Jim.